right. I assume we can start. Yeah. We are good to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, this is the last <coughs> side event of the first day um, here in Bonn. It is quarter to five. And so we are going to take uh, an hour and 15 minutes today to talk about engineering uh, and to talk about energy and climate change. So my name is David Estronati. Uh, I'm the chair of this uh, session. Um, and I will introduce a little bit more about uh, the organization I represent, which is the World Federation of Engineering Organization. Um, today we are going to have three speakers here with me uh, and three panelists. Uh, feel free to ask any question uh, to each of them. And uh, we are going to hope to have a good debate about what they are going to present. Um, this session uh, is organized together uh, with the Engineering Institute of Canada with the E5, which is the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Materials, and with the IEEE, -E -E, uh, which is the Institute of uh, Electronics and Electrical Engineering um, based in, in the United States. So um, very briefly, uh, what we are going to talk is the global stock take uh, on energy and climate change, the engineering and community perspective. And uh, we are going to touch on different aspects of engineering, um, from technological advances and system level assessments regarding energy and transport um, to energy security and sustainable transformation for the, for the future, but also some practical solutions to low carbon energy generation and storage. As promised, uh, very few slides about the World Federation uh, of Engineering Organization, which was founded in 1968 under the auspices of UNESCO uh, in Paris. And it brings together the national engineering institutions from some 100 nations and represents more than 30 million engineers. Uh, we have standard technical committees, as you would expect from engineers. And um, the one that I represent and I chair is the one on engineering and environment. And our focus uh, is on SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal uh, number 13 on climate action. This is just a map of the world with a list of the member um, countries uh, for, for your information. Uh, but what we do also, uh, if, you know, uh, we are looking at the correlation interfaces, interactions between some SDGs. Clearly, climate change uh, interacts with all of them, uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, but our focus is in particular on uh, the SDG 6, uh, water, energy, infrastructure, communities. Uh, and so these are the four additional SDGs uh, on which we work on. So without further ado, I will invite the first speaker, uh, speaker um, Katia uh, Ace Brenner. Uh, she is the director of Guidehouse, uh, a member of E5. And um, just a few words on, on Katia. Um, she is an international climate policy expert uh, with more than 20 years experience uh, in implementing energy programs, climate programs for just climate and energy transition, uh, especially in developing countries. Her specialties include sustainable development, international climate policy, climate finance, and forestry. Katia. Would you like to come here and give your presentation? Good afternoon. My name is Katja. I'm pleased to meet you all today here in Bonn, which is uh, a great city. I hope you will have time to experience it. I'm actually from here, so also welcome to Germany. Um, today I have the pleasure to discuss uh, two important topics. One is on sustainable cooling. One is also on a material solution that I will present on behalf of E5. Cooling is of high importance in the context, context of the climate targets. With increased temperatures, the need for cooling will even increase over the coming years. The Kigali Amendment, which you all know, has an important role in the phase down of HFCs. In 2017, 3.8 gigatons alone were attributed to emissions in cooling. 
In cooling, and just to remind us all, in the technologies, you have two types of emissions. You have uh, a high electricity demand, but at the same time, you also look at the different refrigerants used. I just have brought you an example just to illustrate here. You don't need to look at the individual numbers. The slides can be downloaded later. We have done some analysis in the Egyptian market, and you can see a really a strong growing market of air conditioning devices in this specific case. And whether it's green or not, actually, it shouldn't probably be green, but there is a big interest of the industry in this market, and there will be a high uptake of technologies. There will be needed new, a lot of new ACs in the coming years. That will, of course, have an impact on increasing emissions, but also on increased electricity demand, and specifically when you talk about refrigerants. So what do we need to do then? If we don't act now and introduce the new technologies that are already available, we have a high risk that actually there's an increase in all of the emissions, but we need to address this now to avoid lock-in effects. So the good news is the technologies are available, but at the same time, they are not very well established in all the different markets yet, and they have not been tested, and they are not really trusted yet. You need to look at policy and also economic elements together to drive this. So what we're doing, and that's bringing me to the next part of this, is uh, we have a project supported by the German government where we're working with four, uh, four countries in the MENA region to really demonstrate the, that these technologies are viable, that they have an energy, energy efficiency effect, and that they can actually be implemented. We bring together policy, technology, and finance stakeholders to actually really have a transformational effect in the market. We have a large consortium. Actually, this is about cooperation. COP, we have talked a lot, a lot about cooperation, and you really need all different players together. So we have brought here, I will not name them all, um, a, a large consortium together. Uh, actually, also, I will mention that we have our partner, Ricri, here in the room today, who is the regional coordin coordinator, because it's also about lessons learned sharing all of it. I want to highlight that we will start soon with the demonstration projects and you can that actually will showcase in the region that these technologies can be proven and workable. You find our technology catalogs and all the technologies if you're interested here because they're not only valuable in the MENA region, they can be applied anywhere where you have a hot climate because this is what we need to look into. Coolab is focusing specifically on natural refrigerants. I just want to mention that again, a natural refrigerant is CO2 and propane in this context. So I will not repeat all of it, but accelerating implementation to support the uptake of natural refrigerants and energy efficient cooling systems at the same time will really lead to multidimensional benefits. And I invite you all to connect with us and discuss this and see how it can be implemented on your side you can read all about us later on. But we have now, it's my pleasure to talk about another aspect uh, on behalf of the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Materials. Because while we were talking about air conditioning in buildings before, there's other elements that are important and that have high impact um, on emissions. And specifically, steel and cement claim that their emissions are hard to abate. However, there's a strong need that they become zero and they always claim it's not possible, or often the discussion is it's not possible, but um, we can also deal with the emissions by carbon dioxide removals. The problem is CDR is not at the very beginning and cannot deliver. So we should not only look at that, but actually see what other technology solutions are inside. And the good news is they are available and they are scalable. So negative emission technology is really the only solution for the building industry. One would think of wood in the first place. I must admit, when I was before in this, I thought, okay, wood is the solution. But however, I learned that stone, which is even more abundant, even easier available, has the opportunity to do this because its natural stone is the carbon zero scalability game changer, how we call it here. And how is that? Well, if you look at stone, it has been used in the past in building a house everywhere or in ancient history, you could, you could even say everybody used stone. But there is a problem, it's very heavy, and as soon as you make it thin and everybody wants nice and uh, nice looking buildings and very ar high architecture style, then you need to look at alternatives. So the solution is to prevent thin stone from breaking is that you use carbon fibers. And with carbon fibers that are even using CO2, you can have actually 
the carbon fiber stone, which is lighter than aluminum, pressure stable as steel, needs two times less production energy, is CO2 negative when you make it from CO2, non-rusting, at most long-lived, and with a robust and beautiful surface. So I had to read them out because it's actually so many positive advantages that we really need to look into that. CFS is largely structured yeah, of carbon fiber and stone plates. And the good news is it is available and Kolya Kruse here in the room has all the history. He can provide you all the details how it's actually technically done. And what surprised me most, I must say, is that it's only 10% more expensive, at least at the moment. And that really means to me that there's a lot of opportunity within that. Um, you can see here, this picture is quite amazing. You can see two people holding um, this carbon fiber stone beam, which otherwise they couldn't even lift. You have it applied in staircases, so this is a proof that this is already available. And if you use biochar insulation, you can even increase the uh, positive benefits on storing carbon further in this in insulation. So with this, I will finish and also say here, like the solution is there. We need to scale it to have all an impact together. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. This is fascinating how the history is going back to go forward. I mean, we are going to be in the uh, carbon fiber stone age uh, in the future, <laughs> which is amazing. Thank you for that. The next speaker um, is my colleague, uh, Jean, -Ho Jean Aude Moncomble, uh, who is the chair uh, on the Committee on Engineering and, and Energy at WOFIO. Um, Jean Aude is a Secretary General uh, of the French Council uh, for Energy, uh, which is the member of the of WOFIO since March uh, 20, uh, 2002. Uh, at the European level as well, he chairs the Sustainability Board of SGI Europe. He is a member of several associations in the energy fields uh, and economics. Uh, he is member of the board of the French Economic Association and ensures several lectures universities or Grand Ecole, and he has been chairing the committee uh, at WOFIO since 2019. Jean Aude, please. Thank you very much, Davide. Uh, my presentation uh, will be based on the statement uh, which has been written by the Committee on Energy on the WFEO. Um, what I want to say uh, as a comment about this statement is that, is that it was, in fact, a perhaps the most difficult statement that I have to try to write with other people. Because when we discuss about the future of energy, even if we are all engineers, even if we are all thinking in a very rigorous way, when we decide, when we have to go to the recommendation, it's not so easy. So I am very happy to present you this statement because it is really a consensual statement and uh, it represented that the, in the committee there were representatives from all the energy sources, all the energy technologies, engineers coming from the five continents and we were successful to write together a common paper. So it is uh, this uh, paper that I will present to you. The first point is to say that, of course, energy is at the earth, the earth of uh, climate policy. Mitigation and uh, adaptation, uh, I, I think it's not uh, useful here to, to recall that uh, IPCC analysis are very, uh, show that it is very urgent to, to act. We have to act now. It's not in uh, five years. It's not in 10 years. It is now, now, this year and next year. So uh, we, have, we have tried to have that in mind when we were discussing about solutions, about our analysis. Not the future. Of course, we have to see, to, to watch on the future. But we have to say, what can we do now, now, this year, in 2023? And it is the objective of this paper. Uh, we discuss about mitigation policy. It's, of course, important, but also about adaptation policies, because unhappily, uh, as far as we have only a very small increase of the temperature, we have, we must have adaptation policies. It's not a question to know if we will be at 1.5, 2, 3, 4, I don't know. But in any case, we have to go on with mitigation, but we have also to go on at the same time with adaptation policies. And it is what I have tried to, what we try to do. 
energy, energy is at the curse, and uh, we have two, two main levels uh, to act about uh, energy. Uh, the first one is uh, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is, that is the idea that we must try to, cons to use less energy in the world. So it's a difficult point. In a, in a worldwide organization, it's uh, difficult to discuss that. Because when you are, uh, as I am from Europe, from France, you know that and my very bad accent. Uh, when you are from Europe, well, we can think about to decrease the energy consumption. But when you are in a developing country, it is impossible. It's impossible to say, well, <laughs> you, you are consuming, you are using far less energy than me, but you have to decrease too. So it, it, there is a kind of ethic issue about that. And so we, we, we will never think we have never thought that it was a good way to think in terms of decreasing energy consumption. Of course, we can make effort in the, in the developed country, but we have to think of a new way to developing with more or less, with less energy, but with more energy uh, also in a developing country. Uh, searching, uh, I just want to give a figure, uh, and uh, it is when we look at all the scenarios. Uh, when we look at in the past, you have a decrease of the energy intensity in the world, which is roughly minus 1%, minus 1.5% a year. And when you look at all the scenarios, if you want to fight climate change, you have to go to minus 4% or minus 5% a year. So it's just a way to show you the, the amazing effort that we have to do. It's not a small, it's re really a breakthrough. And we have no choice to do that. We must do that. It doesn't mean that we have to do anything. We have to be clever. We have to make choice. We have to make choice on what we, which is, which is uh, the, most the more efficient and what is the less uh, expensive, because we will not have money for everything. The second point about energy is to decarbonize the energy system. Decarbonizing the energy system is, of course, very, very simple in theory. First, I, I, we were all uh, very, uh, one point was very important. We have to be careful. A lot of people say, well, we, you have to develop electricity, you have to develop hydrogen, because when you use electricity or when you use hydrogen, you don't emit, you don't, don't have a CO2 emission. Of course, it's a mistake. You have not emission at this time, but you have two kinds of emission. First, the emission linked to the equipment that you use. If you have, for example, a, 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 a vehicle, vehicle with hydrogen or electricity, in order to build this vehicle, you have, you have a CO2 emission first. Second, of course, in order to produce hydrogen to produce electricity, to produce heat, you use energy, and this energy could be a carbonized, a carbonized energy. So it's very important to have that in mind. And in every case, we, were, we all agree to a very strong message. We have to think in a systemic way. That is to say, it's not useful to say, well, I, I take this example, I take this uh, application, this use of energy, we have to think globally if we want really to fight climate change. In terms of solution, we have techni technological so choice, of course, and as engineers, we were, uh, of course, focused on this uh, technological choice. But we were really thinking that it was not sufficient. Technology is a part of the solution. It's not the solution, it's a part of the solution. The, the other part of the solution is behavior of the people, behavior of the consumer, behavior of the citizens, and also, Policy, policy choice, energy policy is choice because the states, the government, and all the international organizations can give the direction uh, to the consumer by a lot of tools uh, that uh, we can implement. About uh, low carbon technology, we, we discussed a lot. We discussed a lot. It was very difficult discussion. Three kinds. First, renewable energy. We know this, this solution. It is uh, mainly solar, wind, uh, hydropower, geothermal, uh, biomass. Not all the technology. And I, I, we have to be clear. Not all, well, we have to be clear. We have to think to an make analysis in order to be sure that all the renewable energy are in favor of climate. 
We know that uh, this uh, has all the energy sources, advantage and also this uh, inconvenient. Advantage, of course, very low carbon, sometimes very free carbon uh, energy sources, but also a very large land footprint. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, issue with uh, the acceptation of this uh, solution by people. Uh, people don't want to have a wind turbine on their, on their house. Uh, well, uh, it's a very important issue. We know all the difficulties to develop uh, hydroelectricity in uh, some countries. So n never uh, uh, one solution, uh, no solution is the best, but this solution could be used. Second uh, energy, nuclear power. Nuclear power is not always the solution. It's also a part of the solution. And we were all convinced, whatever the country, some country make the choice of nuclear energy, other not, but all engineers agree on the fact that nuclear is part of the solution. We must not, we will not be able to fight climate change without nuclear. We know the difficulties, waste, safety, dissemination. We have to, we have to work with that. We have to, to deal with that, and we have to be able to, in, to integrate nuclear energy in the field of the solution. Last, last, fossil fuels, yes, of course, because fossil fuels, when we use it with a capture and a storage, a carbon capture and storage, could be a transition solution. It's a mistake to think that we will be able tomorrow, next year, sorry, next year, to have no more uh, fossil fuels in our energy mix. So we have to work in order to develop, in fact, the, the, all the technology of uh, captation and storage of carbon. And uh, it, it will be, of, of course, uh, uh, again, uh, a part of the solution. In all the scenarios, electrici electrification is key. Uh, and we have to, to, to think about that because uh, there were a lot of difficulties in order to say that we are going in a world where the major electricity energy vector will be electricity. That is to say that we have developed, I have said that, renewables, we have to develop nuclear energy on the production side, but we have also to think about energy storage in order to to deal with the variability of some uh, renewables energy, we have to, to think about the demand flexibility. We have to think about a lot of uh, issues, very important issues. And we have also to develop network. It's very important, electricity, the grid. Uh, and so the grid, uh, well, uh, it's not the most uh, funny thing because uh, uh, you, when you have very high level, high tension lines, uh, of course, it's a, it's, it's a difficulty to develop that. One point is very important, it is the search for greater resilience of the energy system, because we are living a world where we will be depending on oil, on the gas, on carbon, on, on coal. But we, we have questions to, to raise without the disposability of land use, of, of land use, of scarcity of water. It's a key issue. It is roughly impossible to produce energy without water. So we are in a world without, with a very important water stress, how to, dis to, to combine that uh, with uh, the issue of producing electricity. And of course, more, or less, more and more, we have the discussion about uh, uh, raw materials. I, I go very quickly uh, on the end. Uh, I want to say that in order to, to do that, we have to think on the future. And one, one point of the future is, is very important. It is the fact that uh, in the future, the most important part of the people and so the most important part of EU, uh, energy consumption will be in the developing country. And uh, I, I will say very briefly uh, uh, one of the results. It is stupid in terms of climate fighting to improve uh, too much the, the, the climate policy in developed country if you do nothing in developing country. Because developed country are roughly, 10, Europe, for example, is 10% of CO2 emission. If we go to carbon neutrality in Europe and we do nothing all around the world, we, will lose, we have lost the fight against climate change. So we have to, to think that. And the, 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 the key word in order to say that is, of course, cooperation. As time is going very quickly, I go to the last, uh, my, my last uh, uh, slide. 
five conclusions. First, adopt a, a systemic approach. It, it is very important to, to think about that. I have said, I have developed this point. Exploit the best mature technology. Yes, if we want to, to fight climate change, we know, I said that at the beginning, IPCC report says that also, uh, next year. That is to say that even if we have very good solution in the future, we have to fight climate change with the technology which are avail available today. We can dream about hydrogen. Hydrogen will be the next step. But the first step is without hydrogen. We, have, we must have that in mind. And it's a very easy solution to say, well, there is hydrogen. Is hydrogen 10 years, at least, at least, 20 better. And of course, associated capacity building. Technology without people is nothing. And I don't say a word about uh, the road, the part of engineers in this issue. Emphasize the real potential of any new technology. We find a lot of new solutions, new technology, yes, but what is the contribution of this technology? We, we, we must find technology we can contribute very substantially to the, the fight against climate change. Give more importance to economic efficiency. Yes, of course, climate is important, technology is important, behavior, but also money. We need money. And we are in a world where we are missing money. So it's very important to have in mind uh, a kind of classification of the different choice in order to begin by the more easy and more, uh, and more cheap, uh, less expensive uh, technologies. And uh, so one criteria is the cost of the carbon ton, carbon ton avoided. And it, it's a way to make a classification of the technology. Last, cooperation. Without cooperation, no solution. And the last point that I want to say is uh, to say that all this technology, we are here in Bonn, we are discussing. Uh, I was listening to the radio this morning in Paris. Our meeting in Bonn are a very, very small part of the news. Uh, but we need the, 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 the acceptability of the people. And the, the, the acceptability of the people, it will not be a successful uh, session, even if this one will be very successful. But uh, the acceptability of the people, is, it is clear. It is economic progress, social justice, environmental preservation. If we are not able to do the three things at the same time, it will be a failure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, jean Gold, and thank you for the work you did to actually achieve these conclusions in a collective uh, agreement, because it must have been very difficult. And I guess the implementation, pursuing these, is going to be even more difficult. The last speaker uh, is going to be uh, from, from Canada. Um, it's going to be uh, Dr. Um, Sylvia Sleep from the um, Schulich uh, School of Engineering in Calgary. Um, she's a system professor of civil engineering um, and her research interests are centered around the development of new methods uh, to assess the life cycle, environmental and economic implications of new technologies to aid decision making under uncertainty, which I guess there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Celia. Yeah, Please. thank you so much for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about the role of systems level tools in evaluating emerging technologies uh, for a net zero future. And so I'm sure a lot of us have seen before these types of graphs um, that show the trajectory that we need to take uh, if we're going to meet net zero GHG emissions uh, by 2050. And so uh, what I really want to focus on today is not just the trajectory that we need to take, but the role that technology needs to play uh, in meeting those net zero futures. And so we have to invest a lot, and there's a lot um, of development going on to um, make these new technologies and bring them to commercialization. And so not just phasing out our current um, fossil intensive, uh, emissions intensive technologies, but also investing in developing um, conventional abatement technologies and uh, to balance out those hard to abate emissions, um, investing in carbon dioxide removal technologies. And so um, what we can see here is sort of the big role that technology will play. Um, but to understand what role individual technologies will play, um, particularly pre-commercial technologies, we really need to take that systems perspective to evaluate what the environmental impacts could be of those technologies once they're deployed at scale. 
And that's where life cycle assessment comes in. And so life cycle assessment is a systems level tool um, for assessing the environmental burdens of a product or process over its life cycle. So from material extraction and processing um, to use and disposal, or what we call from cradle to grave. And so historically, um, LCA has been used um, to inform individual or company level decision making. Um, so the first LCA was done in the 1960s to look at beverage containers, whether plastic or glass would have lower GHG impacts. And it's historically been used um, by companies to say, oh, what are the environmental hotspots from our process? Or how can we reduce our emissions from the sort of existing commercial um, emissions intensive uh, technology? Increasingly, it's being used um, to actually inform policy and those broader level um, systems decision making that we're doing. So things like what would be the GHG implications of sort of using biomass in uh, plastic or fuels, or what the uh, environmental implications could be of electric vehicle adoption within a particular power grid. And so what I wanted to talk today about um, is assessments of uh, the GHG emissions from carbon capture and utilization technologies. And so CCU technologies are really interesting uh, from a systems perspective, as there's a wide range of technologies being developed. There's a wide number of products that could be made from CO2, and there's a wide variety of markets that they can be deployed in. Um, so what you have with CCU is you take CO2 and you can capture it either from an industrial flue gas um, or directly from the air. You concentrate and purify it, um, you uh, compress it, you transport it, and then you can either pump it underground and store it, or you can convert it to a useful product with a market value. And so different, um, there's a range of different products that can be made. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of interest in developing CCU-based products that can displace um, current sort of hard to decarbonize uh, products. And so you can see on the right is um, from the IEA, and that's in the last five years, um, the growth of investments um, in venture capital in CCU startups. And so you can see there was a little bit of a drop from 2020, but a really big increase over the last five years in the development and investments in these CCU-based um, startups, making things like on the blue, that's chemicals and fuels, the dark green is algae-based products, light green is building materials, and the yellow is polymers. So all of these are being developed um, concurrently, and um, all are believed uh, to be, um, that they will play a big role in the future in uh, meeting these sort of net zero targets. And so if we want to evaluate a CCU pathway uh, from a systems perspective, we need to start by putting together its full life cycle. So starting with figuring out where your CO2 will be captured from, the CO2 capture technology, um, looking at the technology that you'll use uh, to actually convert the CO2 into a useful product, the different downstream steps to get it to a market product, and then a range of different possible use cases. Um, so this is, comes from a study um, that we worked on where we were working with researchers who are developing um, electrochemical CO2 conversion technologies called solid um, oxide electrolyzer cells. And they were looking at um, producing methane, methanol, or diesel fuel. And so it could be used either for polymer production um, as a transportation fuel or for power generation. And so here's an example of the kinds of results um, that you can get from an LCA study. Um, and so this is the carbon footprint of CO2-based transportation fuels using renewable energy as the, um, to power the conversion process. And so you can see that there's a range of different um, products that can be made, the methane, methanol, or diesel, via those different technology pathways, so those different electrolyzer combinations. And so each of those bars represents a different um, technology and product um, combination. And the way you read this is that below the zero line are the credits that you get to your system. So you get a credit for your CO2 that's actually converted by your electrolyzer into the product. Um, and then you sort of ha incur a cost of emissions from the different processing and use stages. Um, so you would have a positive emission from your CO2 capture, emissions from the supply chain of the renew renewable energy that's powering your conversion system, and then the end use phase. And what you can see is the diamonds for those different bars are the net CO2 emissions from your system. Um, and you can compare this to see the net GHG benefit from actually deploying these technologies in the market. Your, your net benefit is the difference between um, that diamond or the net emissions from your CCU-based pathway and what your incumbent would be. Um, so in, the incumbent, in this case would be like conventional gasoline-powered vehicles. 
And so the big takeaway from this is that you know, there's a very wide range of CO2-based pathways. Um, each of them has a different uh, technology performance and a different benefit relative to the incumbent today. Um, and the magnitude of that benefit depends on a number of different factors. So when we look at, say, CCU, we can't sort of give a, a general number about the benefit. You really need to take this system's perspective and consider both um, the performance of the technology and also the context where it's being deployed. Um, and so for these specific pathways, you know, all of them had net positive emissions, um, but that you could get big benefits um, relative to today's uh, transportation fuels. And so just taking a little bit of a step back um, and thinking about how we assess LCA of new technologies, um, the sort of main things we want to consider are both the performance of the technology and how that might change as the technology commercializes, as well as the market that it's being deployed in. And so whether or not that deployment context is going to change today versus in the future once the technology is deployed, um, the kind of incumbent the technology will be competing against, so whether that will be against like a conventional gasoline vehicle for transportation, or 20 years in the future, you might be comparing against an electric vehicle as your baseline. And then changes to, say, the supply chain or the operation um, and use phases. So just all things you want to be considering um, when you're taking that sort of systems perspective to evaluate a new technology. And uh, thank you. I'll turn it back to David. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, you know, it is incredible uh, because you, whenever we mention technology, we always have a little bit of a relaxed moment. Technology will sort out everything. And I'm always very skeptical uh, because effectively without behavioral changes, uh, technology is not going to sort out everything. But I think that your presentation gave, gives me hope again, <laughs> because there's a hell of a lot of work done on the te technological aspects in innovation, I guess, um, that will, will, will address, will help us uh, to address climate change. Right, so if you have questions or comments uh, for the three speakers, please hold them a little bit longer. <laughs> Apologies for this, because we have three panelists as well. So now we have a little bit of a swap uh, of, of people. Uh, I would thank again uh, all the three speakers. Uh, I will see you again here in 15 minutes uh, for the Q&A. And I would invite the three panelists to come uh, to the stage. And um, they will give a little bit shorter uh, presentation just to give you a little bit more the flavor of what engineering is doing uh, and can do. But please, hold all your questions uh, for, for, for later. We have time. Right. So I think, David, if you press the button. Yeah, I think I'm first. So. You may be first. David knows uh, is going to be the first one. Uh, and uh, he's right. David Lapp, uh, WOFU, uh, Committee on Engineering and the Environment as well. And he's representative of Engineers Canada. David. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, look at it at, uh, from the point of view of implementing low carbon climate resilient infrastructure. So energy, of course, is a big piece of that. Um, but I'm going to sort of take a broad infrastructure perspective, just making a few comments given the time frames we have. So really, what are we, what are we trying to achieve, you know, with infrastructure is, is low carbon, energy conscious, I use the word conscious, so being aware of energy demands and both in terms of you know, building the infrastructure and operating it and then climate resilient. So infrastructure, of course, gets impacted hugely by uh, climate, extreme climate events, for example, can be destroyed or seriously damaged. And you, know, you can have uh, great systems in, a, in, say, a building that are low carbon or, you know, carbon neutral net zero, but if your building is destroyed by, uh, by a climate event, then all of that goes for naught. So you need to consider uh, climate resilience as part of that equation. And that's an obligation we have as engineers, really, is that you know, we, we need to uh, you know, consider the public interest, um, look at uh, you know, health and safety, uh, welfare, which includes economic uh, considerations, and of course the environment. 
And uh, we're not alone in this, uh, trying to solve this. It's around, you know, we need to work with others, uh, other disciplines of engineering, multiple disciplines, other pr practitioners, uh, architects, et cetera. Uh, and, and of course, this is a multi-stakeholder kind of issue uh, involving the public and, and others. And uh, we have to think about it in terms of, as was mentioned, life cycle. So we have infrastructure that's going to be around for 50 to 100 years, and the climate's going to be changing through that period. Uh, and so we need to take that into account, um, you know, how fast, how much, what are the risks and so forth. And so we need to, uh, you know, it's a combination of things as was stated, you know, policies, there were subject to legislation and laws, um, uh, needs, societal needs, uh, the environment, uh, the sort of the triple bottom line of sustainability. Uh, we really need to consider that. So climate is part of that whole consideration uh, of how to come up with solutions. And you can't separate the mitigation from the, from the, uh, the adaptation uh, when it comes to infrastructure because of the need for resilience. Um, and so you need to, uh, you know, th think about, say, in a low carbon building. Again, I was mentioning the example of be being impacted by climate. Um, so you need to preserve that building and make sure that it operates and continues to provide the service. Part of this, this of course, is around standards. Um, standards we have today, but they are going to change over time. Uh, when you're talking 50 to 100 years, um, you can't just base it on today's standards. You've got to think about the future and the climate change, and the whole system of standards will change over that life of that infrastructure. Um, and I think that um, you know we have to think about in terms of the carbon, like uh, say for infrastructure is you know the carbon that's generated from the operation of that infrastructure. Uh, so the emissions that happen uh, uh, from the operations and maintenance, again, over a long period of time. There's also the whole notion of embedded carbon uh, and how, you know, in materials uh, like low carbon cement, for example, is, is, a, is a, a, one of the technologies that can be used. Um, and that's for the materials itself and then during the construction process. And then, of course, the, the measurement and accounting of GHG. We need to make sure we've got uh, you know, internationally accepted standards and methods for doing this. Uh, and uh, so there's the process itself of, of measuring, accounting, and then reporting and making sure that we are making progress in this area. And so it's all of these, uh, balancing all these things that, uh, you know, is going to vary in its mix and, and approaches depending on the type of infrastructure that we're talking about, uh, the, how it uses energy, and uh, whether we're talking about a new build of an infrastructure or, or a retrofit. And one of the big areas there, of course, is buildings where, you know, we have many existing buildings. There's been a lot of work done on new buildings, but I would point out that retrofits of existing buildings remains a huge challenge and one that we as engineers and others need to focus on. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, David. The next speaker is Kolja Kuse. He is the chairman of the board of the European Business Council for Sustainable Energy, which is commonly known as uh, E5. Do you want to come over here? Yeah. Good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Kolja Kuse. Um, we have been talking about engineering and one of the main problems of engineering is to uh, keep an overview on uh, what is engineering. And engineering is not only uh, concerned with uh, energy production but also a lot with materials production and that is often forgotten in the whole discussion uh, about climate change. Um, uh, Katja did mention the cooling. Um, uh, systems uh, approach that we need a lot of new cooling uh, devices, uh, many more cooling devices, much more energy for that. But uh, to give you an example that this is only half of the story, um, we need to take into account that uh, cooling is also very much connected to, how does it work here? Ah, yeah. Cooling is, is, is very much connected to uh, insulation. So if we are only looking at the cooling uh, optimization, uh, this will not 
save the whole problem. We have to look at the insulation problems as well. As, and that is very much concerned with um, uh, the whole world of materials. And the whole world of materials is often forgotten in the uh, engineering discussion. They always talk about energy, energy and energy. We have been hearing this for 10 years, for 20 years, and no one is really talking about materials. And that, that's something we want to change. And uh, we... Um, are questioning, for example, what is the best insulation material. Um, we have developed uh, house walls, for example, that are made from stone and carbon fibers. The carbon fibers can be uh, made from CO2, so, so that could be a large uh, CO2 sink, while the cement and the steel industry is claiming their uh, emissions are hard to abate. We, we say we need a carbon negative building materials and get rid of cement and steel if that is necessary. And uh, uh, cooling is, is needed in, uh, a, a good insulation is needed in cold and also in hot regions. And um, that is the point we want to make here as E5, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, uh, used to be the name of E5 and we added the materials aspect and we are the only NGO that have the word materials in their, um, in their uh, um, NGO description. And uh, I would leave, leave it with this to, uh, to start uh, later a very interesting discussion, hopefully, about these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And I think the last panelist uh, is Dr. Merkebe de Missy. Um, he is Assistant Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Calgary in Canada, and he's representing Engineering Institute of Canada. All right, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we heard from our speakers and panelists uh, different perspectives regarding our energy system and also different negative emission technologies and also a system level uh, tool that we can use to evaluate different technologies for reaching net zero. I'm going to talk about a transition and energy approach that we can use in order to assess different pathways in getting to net zero. It's an alternative uh, uh, perspective. I'm going to use the energy system of Canada to talk about what uh, energy system perspective would look like. So Canada is a research, uh, sorry, a uh, resource uh, rich country. Uh, we harvest uh, energy from different sources, including uh, water, uh, radi solar radiation, uranium, and of course crude oil. And we convert these energy sources into a useful form in order to provide services for different end users. So among these end users, the transportation sector is entirely dependent on fossil fuel and responsible for generating up to 25% of uh, the GHG emission. So it's very interesting to see this energy flow. If we track the flow of energy uh, through the economy, we can actually clearly see the challenges of getting to net zero. That's why I brought this, this map. So over the years, for example, Canada implemented different strategies in order to cut down emission. Uh, even though Canada is in the right path in GHG reduction, but didn't manage to meet, for example, some of the major climate targets, including the Kyoto commitment and also the Copenhagen climate target. It will be much difficult to meet the Paris 2030 or Paris 2050 targets if we are implementing the same strategy. So the insight from this transition, system transition can be helpful. That's the argument here. If we take some of the insight from past system transition and implement them uh, in this uh, approach or uh, strategies to accelerate different pathways to uh, reach uh, a net zero future. So uh, this system transition perspective is about uh, a methodology or an argument uh, that came up if we, if we really want to accelerate the path to 
uh, net zero future, we have to fundamentally change the system provisioning, uh, so, uh, societal provision, uh, provisioning systems, uh, the way we produce and distribute energy, the way we move uh, freight and goods, well, the way we build our cities or do our agriculture has to be fundamentally changed, and we can cha we can we can seek some sort of insights from uh, past system transitions in order to accelerate uh, this uh, transformation. So, as an engineer, I'm very confident we can actually design and produce different technologies to cut down emission. But it's very important to understand. Uh, the stage of these different technologies and apply uh, the proper type of policy mix to accelerate uh, their their importance or their their impact on this next zero of future. So one example is in transportation system. For example, we have a system transition in the past. Uh, we used to have this horse drawn. A transportation system that was accelerated due to the internal combustion engine technology. Uh, we also have other recent system transition due to this computing, digitization. Uh, the way we do things right now is much, much different uh, than the way we do things 20, 30 years ago. So all this transition, whether this system transition happened within a few years or uh, uh, in a long duration, system transition have these three stages. We have uh, emergency stage, technology emergency stage, then the diffusion stage, and system reconfiguration. So we have to understand the level of uh, these technologies, whether they are in their emergence stage. So we talked about the hydrogen economy is basically a technology that is currently in the emergency stage. We have electric vehicle, the type of technology, it is in a diffusion stage, so we cannot apply the same policy mix to accelerate the path to net zero. So that is uh, what I wanted to present today. Uh, I will pause here and let, uh, return it to give the floor to David, and I'll be happy to answer uh, any question you have on this yes. topic. We can yeah. stay there. Stay there. Thank you so much. Uh, I would invite the three speakers to come to the stage. There are three chairs, it's not by chance. Um, because now it is the time for Q&A, and this is quite difficult, actually, yeah, to get from... I think you are the first one. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Günther Hermeyer. I'm from Germany, and uh, we are busy with um, nuclear issues for about uh, four decades, and it's to the colleague from France. Um, I could make many, many comments, but just one from the World uh, Meteorological Organization, uh, a statement a warning in connection with nuclear as a solution to the climate crisis. Uh, you saw it in France last year. Um, the rivers, not enough water, too hot water. We had already had that in Germany one time. So I can go on and on and on like this. Uh, this is just one statement, from, not from me, but from the World Meteorological Organization on nuclear, which absolutely cannot be a solution to the climate crisis. Thank you. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, nuclear is not the solution. It is a part of the solution. It would be a mistake to, to focus... Uh, perhaps some, like, uh, some countries like France, uh, to focus a very important part of the production of, uh, on, uh, on nuclear energy. But it will be the same uh, uh, bad solution. To, to fo When you say 100%, you are wrong. It's very easy. 100% is always a bad solution. Uh, so the solution is a mix. The solution is a mix between renewables, between nuclear, and each country will make its choice in function of what you say. And uh, the, of course, uh, the availability of water is a very important issue. You, you have not to make, it, but you don't make the mistake between uh, mis consumption and mi withdrawal. Uh, it's not the same thing. In fact, the, the consumption, uh, but uh, you need you need water in any case. Uh, uh, so. Uh, 
the, 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 the first issue, I, I will not say the same thing again, first, energy efficiency. And I, I think we agree on that. After the discussion between renewable nuclear... Sorry? No, uh, well, uh, the, the second point after is you are not able to, to decrease totally the energy consumption, so you are made to, to produce energy. Uh, it, it was a difficulty in the group to, to write the, the, the statement. Some people say, well, more renewables, more nuclear. Well, we have, a, what I have say is that it is a mix and each country makes its choice, but we must not close a choice. Each country has a, the possibility to make this choice. Thank you. Thank you for this question and this answer. I could imagine that nuclear always raises uh, lots of... Yes, thank you. My name is Liebke Thies from Germany, GIZ. Um, my question goes to the carbon storage. Um, I do think you're right. We have to look at any technology uh, to um, to cope with climate change, also carbon um, carbon capture, and then what to do with it, carbon storage is one. Uh, carbon storage, to pump it un under the ground, is the same as uh, pump uh, nuclear waste under the ground. Um, out of sight is out of mind, but it doesn't mean it's not there anymore, and um, what happens with it and what happens with it over a longer time period. I don't know whether anybody wants to respond. It was not a question, it was a comment. No, it was, a I was a, what, Sorry? It was a question. It was a question. Okay, I think Jean Odd is enjoying. I, I don't want to answer all the questions. Uh, of course, I want to share the, uh, I, I, again, I agree. Uh, I totally agree that uh, storage, uh, the, the idea to, 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 to store CO2 underground is not uh, the best solution. But uh, the reality uh, is climate, climate urgency. Uh, if we have a lot of time, if, we have this, if, the, if this discussion would have been 50 years ago, the, we will not have the same, the, same, the same discussion. We have no choice now. We have to decrease CO2 emission. So we have to put CO2 to store CO2 underground. If we don't do that, uh, we will have an increase of... Uh, it is the same answer than for nuclear. I, I personally, I, am, I, would not very be, I would not be very happy to live near uh, CO2 storage uh, because I know the risk. But I know also the climate risk. And I think that the climate risk is far more important than the, the risk with uh, CO2 storage or the risk with nuclear energy. But it's a choice. But, uh... Right, interesting. Lots of questions. Never had so many questions to an engineering debate. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists uh, for a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, pretty, pretty much appreciate everything that you said. Uh, my name is Ken Kitatani. I'm the director of the International Council on Environmental Economics and Development. We're a UN-affiliated think tank based in New York. Um, this is not a controversial question, but a, a practical question. Uh, perhaps I could open up to everyone, but especially starting with uh, Mr. Moncom again. Um, Concerning the uh, carbon capture storage, the, the information that's out there, uh, research that we hear is that it's not ready to scale yet uh, in terms of the development. Uh, what are your comments on that? And also, um, what do you think of direct air capture technology? I think the question was for you. <laughs> it's really the pressure. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, 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 am, I, don't, I am not sure that I have understood the first part of the question, so I will answer the second one. Uh, of the case, sorry. The first part is uh, most people f believe that this technology, carbon cap capture technology, is not ready to scale. Okay. Yeah. 
Do you agree with that? Or, uh, and if not, I mean, what? Uh, what I understand is that uh, uh, when you say uh, uh, capture and storage, there are two words. Capture, storage. For capture, I think we are OK. Uh, it's a matter of cost. Uh, but uh, it's a good. Uh, we know how to capture CO2. Of course, not uh, CO2 uh, from a, a very uh, uh, f when you have concentrated emission. Uh, no question to capture the CO2 from each uh, car. Of course, uh, about storage is a more difficult issue. And uh, I, I come back on the, the, from the, the, the question before. Uh, we know that uh, it's a matter. Of, it's a, a question for geologists. Uh, are, are, are they able to say, well, we are sure that in this kind of uh, uh, cavern uh, you are able to store CO2 for a sufficient long time? Uh, well, so uh, uh, we have not the same quality, and I, I understand that we are not uh, so, so proud of the solution. Bef between capture and storage, <coughs> there is also the issue of transportation. Uh, but uh, we have to, to we have to deal with this. I, 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 I insist on the issue of the systemic approach. Uh, it's the same for storage, of course. Uh, <laughs> so uh, capture and storage is a good experiment, and I think that the first results are, uh, are, are optimistic. Uh, we will not be able again to store 100 percent of the CO2 emission. It, CO2 storage is part of the solution. About uh, direct capture, uh, air capture, uh, sorry, I don't know in English. <laughs> uh, I, I think we have to be careful. Uh, for me, it's typically uh, what it, it is typically the very young technology. We know that there are good examples. Uh, I have seen an uh, example in Iceland uh, with, uh, for example, uh, International Energy Agency has published a very interesting report on that. Well, but not for tomorrow, uh, not for tomorrow, uh, for the st next step. And uh, it's very important to think now to the next step, but acting now uh, also, <laughs> uh, it's part of the solution. Oh, sorry, uh, we have to be, to verify that it's okay, because what I have heard uh, about uh, some technologies that uh, there are uh, some uh, dark points. <laughs> right. Can I just ask you whether yes. your question is for Jean or? I hope not. No, okay, good. Because I would like to give some. Oh. Hello, my name is Abu Bakr, and I'm an engineering student from Denmark. Um, I'm currently doing my bachelor project in which I am using to recycle wind blades in concrete production, which is one thing that you talk, both things you talked about, uh, energy as well as concrete and emissions in that. Uh, I was also s attending a session here today which talked about how in some parts of the world they don't even have energy as of right now. What I see is the difference between uh, some countries in a very different technical uh, logical challenge with while some others are even facing the problem of making sure energy is present how do we make sure that any uh, the technologies developed in i guess the global north are transferred across the world and do companies need to profit when they uh, transfer technologies especially considering we all accept that we are in a climate emergency right now thank you Do you want to ask this question to anybody in particular? Uh, any panelist or speaker uh, would like to answer to this question with comments? Yeah, Sylvia. Sorry, I got it wrong, Katya. That's also fine. Well, thanks a lot for the question. I think it's very important to see the different nuances and the situations every country and even every city and even every local circumstances is in, whether it's, and I think you have actually several questions raised in this. So when we look at the technologies, where are they applied? I mean, actually, there was not enough time to talk about actually the solutions, because when we look in the specifically on the cooling side, uh, the first is we look at demand reduction. I think that it's not that we immediately come uh, with the technologies, but that we look at what is available and what we can make use. And that's the same for the north and the south. And there's a lot of good uh, knowledge on that, even historically knowledge on how to build houses and where how to paint them white I mean even simple shading there's a lot of things that uh, can be 
very much used. So I think that's for me the, the first important one. The second, whether um, companies need to make money, I think that's a, a broader question that could apply to very other, well, to the whole uh, concept. And that's a philosophical question more or less even maybe. But what I think is there is also a solution that, in the cooling sector, you can see there's a high interest by the industry at the moment to make money on the synthetic refrigerants as long as possible. Through the Gigali Amendment, it's clear that they need to be phased out, but it could be done faster. So I think there's a fair question. Is it fair to stay with these technologies or should we increase the speed of changing and the shift? And I think that's maybe a question where we could say, because of course there will be still be money made on the technology, but should it be even leapfrogging some technologies because everybody knows it will change eventually anyway? So I think on that nuance, I think that's an important question to say. And that's even here. And I, somebody said it before, and I like that phrase. It's like even actually the right for leapfrogging because we know that there's a technology is available and it's potentially to leapfrog, but maybe even that some countries have the right to leapfrog to not get into lock-in effect. And that, I think, where a serious discussion should be held with the industry. I don't know whether there's anything else from, thank you. Any other? Yeah, David. Yeah, just, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat. But um, yeah, I think part of the technology transfer is not only the um, effectively transferring the technology per se uh, in terms of installing it, but it's also the operation and maintenance of that technology and having the people trained to be able to do that in a sustainable way because there are many examples of great systems being installed in, in countries and then they fall uh, into disrepair and uh, end up over the long term making n little difference because there aren't the people with the knowledge and skills and capacity to, to operate them and maintain them. Brilliant. Uh, hi, um, I'm Alice. I'm from the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. I just had a quick comment on the question about the storage of CO2 underground. Um, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think the issue with uh, storage of CO2 is that it's just as dangerous as storing nuclear waste long term. Like the amount of carbon in the Earth system doesn't really change. The issue is where it is. The issue is the carbon being in the atmosphere that's causing climate change. If it's in the rock, if it's in inert, it's not causing the same problem. The amount of carbon doesn't change. It just flows from one reservoir to another. I've, I would say the bigger kind of issue and challenge with this is perhaps the over-reliance on CCS as a solution for mitigation of climate change rather than it's I mean it's a very complex um, challenge to overcome you mentioned the issue of just transporting co2 from where it's being captured to where it's being stored like the whole the whole system will be very complicated and expensive so to over rely on that kind of technological solution when there might be simpler solutions relating to behavioral change and demand etc um, yeah C comment <laughs> I, I would like to answer this, uh, the question. <clears throat> so, so one thing, uh, let me make a statement at, at this uh, point first. Um, the, the, um, uh, um, the IPCC um, uh, is calling for carbon dioxide removal. Without carbon dioxide removal CDR, we cannot uh, meet the targets. We cannot meet 1.5, we cannot meet 2 degree. It's impossible. So we need to have carbon dioxide removal. The question is how we do this. Um, there's one comment, an uh, additional comment. It's not the question where the CO2 is. It's a question in what form the sea is bound. So uh, CCS, uh, uh, to answer the other question uh, briefly, um, may not be uh, so dangerous as you think, because if you store it in, in basalt rock, uh, it will mineralize and 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 the carbon is really bound it's 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 gone forever the question is the cost who who takes the cost for ccs so my point is isn't it better to store the the the, the carbon in building materials for example not wood but in in the example uh, we uh, we, are, we are showcasing here 
uh, we are working in a, in a big German uh, uh, science project called CDR Terra. This stands for Carbon Dioxide Removal Terra. And they are looking at all the different aspects of CDR. It's uh, more than 60 uh, institutions and universities working in that project. It started um, a year ago. And uh, within the framework of this project, we developed this house wall, which is highly carbon negative. It, it, uh, it could eventually uh, change uh, the whole paradigm for insulation. We could capture a lot of CO2 uh, making charcoal or, or biochar, uh, which uh, produce, produces many other uh, uh, different materials like, like CO2 that we may use to, to make uh, uh, um, e-fuels. Um, and uh, we could use uh, stone to, to, to eliminate uh, the need for cement, which will definitely be hard to uh, decarbonize. We can use uh, carbon fibers to replace steel, and the carbon fibers, for example, we have shown uh, in a project with Technical University of Munich can be made from um, algae oil. So all of these new technologies are possible, but let me repeat my statement. We need a CDR, otherwise we cannot meet the targets. Thank you for this contribution. Hi, this is a perfect, the, uh, actually perfect uh, to my question, because um, I'm Tom Tice uh, from Yango, but uh, also an en engineer, and um, you made perfect point to carbon fiber, but we also, could use carbon fiber in uh, cement and et cetera and use it as a new technology, but we also need to look at carbon fiber on the whole life uh, cycle assessment because when we cycling carbon fiber, we also have the uh, possibility of getting asbestos fibers because we can't recycle it forever. Let me make one point here. We, we are not going to recycle the carbon fibers. The, the, the C in the carbon fiber is bound for millions of years. So we are going to store the carbon fiber underground. Okay, to so... Get, to get rid of the carbon fiber. We want to capture as much CO2 as possible from ambient air, bring it into the carbon fiber, and then get it back into the earth uh, in, in granite uh, formations, for example. They, they, this will be safe for millions of years. Okay, thank you. I think there's time for one last question. And I guess that for our colleagues and friends from academia, life is much more difficult outside with all these opinions and emotions. Hello, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the carbon fiber stone, as uh, Svenja spoke about. Um, I'm also a uh, civil engineer. Um, civil engineering student. Um, and I would like to know how is the, as you said that the weight of the stone is somehow, as it weights less than usual stone. And, um, but I want to know how is the behavior of the material uh, about um, heat conductivity? Also, is it, is it also better for isolation, but or is it that we have to pay somehow also more for the whole isolation stuff uh, for the whole building? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, um, so, so th there, there is not a lot of knowledge in uh, engineering about stone. So we have many, many <laughs> new things to tell about the stone. First of all, the stone has the same specific weight uh, as aluminum, round about 2.8, 2.9 gram per cubic centimeter. Aluminum is at 2.7. No one believes this. So then I, I tell the people, if you don't believe me, you just Google. <laughs> it's easy to find uh, the specific weight of, of granite. Uh, it's amazing, but it's a fact. And the next amazing for, uh, fact is that the granite has the same flexibility as aluminum, but only under compression. So the, the, the tensile strength of the granite uh, is, is not very high. It's, it's still four times higher than that of concrete. So, so uh, 
if we have this stone for building, we are not talking about concrete anymore. The stone is four times more pressure stable than concrete, and it's four times more uh, resilient in, in, in tensile strengths. But the lack of tensile strengths, we can compensate with the carbon fibers. And because the carbon fiber is so stiff, it can prevent the, uh, the bending of stone from breaking the stone. So the material is flexible. So it has everything that you need to build uh, uh, buildings or even cars or airplanes with the material. Thank you for this. And um, I would like you all to join me in thanking the panelists and the, and the speakers for their answers. <laughs> and, uh, and I thank all of you, clearly, for your questions and your participation. Um, uh, this is not my first um, participation to the UNFCCC uh, conventions like uh, the Intersectional of COP, but it's been definitely the most lively with lots of questions, lots of opinions, and, um, and it shows that engineering is important, it's fundamental, uh, but equally it can be controversial. So for, for us as engineers, we clearly need to, uh, you know, talk, share, uh, and listen a lot to all the questions we are receiving uh, and giving answers, reassuring. It's not going to be an easy one uh, to progress, uh, but it's a must, uh, because effectively the 1.5 degrees is going to be difficult to, to achieve it without engineering and, uh, and without decisions that are going to be based on evidence and rationale. Um, so I thank all of you uh, for this uh, very lively debate. Thank again to the panelists and the speakers, and uh, I wish you a pleasant evening and, and a great uh, remaining part of the intersessional. Thank you. <laughs>